Okay, so first uh, I'd like to write the, uh, the relations uh, which are not uh, obvious. So remember that uh, when we had a plate uh, something like one, two, three, uh, maybe n, uh, this was a plate. So this was x1 bigger than 0, x12 bigger than 0, and so on, where this one was equal to x1 plus x2. So the basis For plates, so this is a plate. The basis for plates are the plates uh, which have one in first lump. By the way, these plates uh, are the ones which appear in uh, theories like the, uh, uh, if you take a plate which is inside a uh, hypersimplex, uh, well, not a plate, but really a permitohedron. So the permitohedra are generated by plates, and the permitohedron inside a hypersimplex uh, has the same data as a matroid, so it's, uh, it's a big uh, theory there. So plates which have one in first lump, and uh, there's a basis. And now um, we want to, uh, the relation, so the first type of relation is uh, bring to basis. So, in this case, if you have a plate like, uh, uh, and let's say, uh, uh, I'm going to work on an example, otherwise it takes too long to write uh, five. Uh, let me write it like this, five, four, uh, Three and one, two. Yes, so this this is uh, that's the important one. These could be replaced, could be replaced by lumps. In which case, uh, uh, something like. Uh, uh, so the, and then the lumps by unions. What I mean by this is that you can have, for instance, one replaced by two, three, four, this is a lump, and then uh, two replaced by uh, five, seven, and then one, two, the lump one, two will be replaced by two, three, four, five, seven. Yes, so all the relations are, uh, uh, are invariant to such things. And also we're going to have just one is, uh, one is distinguished, so the rest can be relabeled without loss of generality. And uh, now here, the, uh, you have a plate in which one is in a position which is not in front. Yes, and then this is a sum of, um, so this is a set A, uh, 
this is a set B starting from one. And this is a sum of a uh, minus one to the uh, cardinality of A plus lumping sign. I'm going to explain this. Uh, and then it's a sum of uh, A reversed shuffled here with a nice uh, Russian letter which happens to be sh and which is also working for the word shuffle. Uh, this is a standard notation. A reversed shuffled with B and shuffle prime and then uh, lumps And the primes are uh, because they need some explanation here. So this is put here. So uh, what we do is you reverse A and uh, shuffle it with B with the following property. So the shuffle prime means that uh, um, one is in the first lump in the first lump always and the lump prime uh, is uh, just a bit let me also uh, put this on uh, on the screen Maybe it's it's uh, easier to see there. Let me lower the screen. So here we are. You have an x, y. These are the first things followed by a, b. Uh, a would be one here. And the overall sign, uh, so you reverse the x, y's. You reverse them in order. You make them y, x. Then you shuffle lumps them, which means that you shuffle them. Um, what is a shuffle in mathematics? You have a, a few sets and you take their union uh, such that when you restrict ordered union, ordered unions, such that if you restrict the order to each of them, you get the initial order, yes? So if you shuffle one, two, three with four, five, six, uh, you, you need to have always w one, two, three in, the, in, the, in order, four, five, six in order and the rest is the same. So this is exactly like shuffling cards in a pack. Yes, and uh, the condition, the also the condition here is that you can lump them as you wish, but no two A, Bs, so these are from the second set, no two such things uh, must be in the same lump. Yes, so this is applied to x, y, 1, a, b, and bring it to the base, which starts with 1. Yes. So this is a relation of the plates to the base. Uh, the, uh, the proof of this, which we'll discuss, will uh, involve writing them in terms of trees. That's how I found it. That was a reason for going to those trees, 
because if you want the values of a plate at a point, that point depends to depends on, I mean, if you want them on a shard, it depends on the knowledge of shards, and the shards are unclassifiable at this moment in mathematics. So, uh, it's clear this way what you're going to get are, uh, since one, do you see A is in the first lump, this way you'll bring the uh, plates to bases. Yes, and you can restrict it. Actually, you don't need all of these because remember that uh, uh, you may you may just want to work with the uh, with uh, uh, the base is. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean you you may want to go to the bases of trees or so, which is which is also interesting. Now, this is a, these are the blades. These are co-dimension one blades. Uh, bring them to the, the relation which brings them to, to the base. Once again, you start with X, Y, A, B, but remember that the base is for, uh, is base is here, not base. So uh, the basis for uh, blades, for co-dimension one blades, are the blades which start with one, two, because the blades are cyclically ordered. Remember the blades were something like this in 2D. Yes, they're cyclically ordered and because they have co-dimension one, so you don't distinguish this side from this side. They are a forest. When you write them, they give you a forest with two trees. And uh, uh, when you apply all the all uh, uh, all our uh, relations that between the image of trees which we did last time, you're going to have here something a tree which starts the first tree is lonely and it starts with one because you can use the the grafting to move everything to the second one. The second one has two at the very top and the rest here, yes, and uh, those may be lumped. So uh, the basis is accordingly, the basis, uh, the, if it's a non-degenerate blade, then it's a, it starts with one, two, and uh, this is in co-dimension one. And if you, uh, uh, more generally, uh, these could be lumped. So, so this could be a lump containing one, and then this is the smallest uh, number which is not in the first lump. Uh, now, these uh, blades uh, appear. Uh, uh, there are some relations now in uh, quantum, in perturbative quantum field theory, but a more modern theory of it the unitary ones, which started about uh, 15 years ago, in certain, under certain circumstances, I mean, the, the Feynman diagram still describe every case, but under certain uh, conditions, you can use uh, these uh, restricted, this, this other system, this system seems to have relations with the, with the blades, which we have here written as uh, generating functions. And uh, my student, Nick, uh, Nick Early, is working on uh, such things with the physicists. So, so uh, uh, I should describe also, before we go further, that uh, the vial denominator uh, gives you so the vial denominator gives you uh, what's called the constant function. So it gives you this multiplicity when you are right near a, uh, uh, I mean, these are simple roots. And uh, these are the multiplicities, for instance, these are the multiplicities of, uh, of, uh, uh, of 
of uh, representation uh, of SL3. You must have seen this if you looked in books on representation theory. This is how it looks near the boundary, and these numbers are the number of ways we have described this of writing um, uh, positive roots as a sum of uh, a positive, uh, a, 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 not a positive root, it's a, a root, well, a point in the root, in the uh, span, span of positive roots, to write it as a sum of positive roots. So for instance, this one, this point here, when you have here one, 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 this is two because you can write it as itself or as a sum of these two roots. Yes? So uh, if you would write this, you would have a, if you write it as a, if you write an expansion and you put, I don't know, X for instance, just to keep things simple, and Y, this would be one over one minus X, one over one minus Y, and here this would be Z, one over one minus Z. So this is a product of one over one minus uh, E to the uh, R, where R is positive. R is a positive root. And now if you want the plate, the plate would, would have in the same, would have everywhere once, yes? So this is a generating function of a plate, which I found. And uh, this is very simple. Uh, you, you, you use the fact that every uh, root in the cone Every positive root has a unique expression in terms of uh, of uh, simple roots. Yes, so what you have there is just uh, the product of uh, uh, R positive simple root of 1 over 1 minus E to the R. These are the variables, E to the R. Yes, so you don't take the product of all, of all the roots, but over the simple roots, yes? And uh, some similar function here gives you the, uh, uh, an expression for uh, uh, blades, because they are made of plates, yes? So there you have a cyclic sum. Very good. So now uh, here are the blades related to base. The expression is uh, exactly the same. So again, you, uh, you have a sign coming from the ones that you reverse, which are yx. You put exactly, you have an overall lumping sign, which means that whenever you lump k things into one, you will have minus one to the k minus one. So you have a sign of minus one each time you shorten the expression by lumping. That's a lumping sign. And uh, uh, in the end, you have a, a strange new term in which all the A, Bs, all the, all the second part, are in a lump together. And uh, the x, y's, and so are not lumped at all. So, and also as uh, opposed to the previous case, b must be, so this last thing must be in the last lump. So a should be in the first lump, b in the last lump. Uh, these expressions are unique. The, they give you the expression of an arbitrary blade 
or played in terms of the things which are in the base. Yes, so once you have that, you can bring anything to the base. Now, the last one where all the ABs are in a lump, this lump may not contain one. Um, and uh, in that case, you continue inductively. Very good. So this is, uh, these are the blade relations to a base, but the blades have uh, simplified, I mean, the understanding of that has progressed since this, so, and I will describe, I think I mentioned last time that there is a big matrix which has a blades in all the co-dimensions, and this big matrix is invertible. So a relation between blades like this one corresponds to constructing a higher co-dimension blade. So if you do this to the, the blades, then you get, uh, if you do this to the full blades that we described last time, then you, have, you get a higher co-dimension blade. Very good. So this is a part that I... Uh, uh, now, this is a big matrix, and uh, I'm going to describe it if, if uh, there is time at the end of the uh, class. Uh, uh, let me see the, the uh, here were a few of the... Uh, this this was a stems, okay, and uh, the stems. The program was opened in the correct place, but uh, but uh, ah yes. Uh, this is uh, an interesting, so the, these last lessons, because of the lack of time, as I was telling you, there is, a, uh, there is much more material than time here, uh, will be uh, a bit more like a seminar talk. So, uh, uh, let me describe a bit the Sterling numbers. So, uh, the uh, the Sterling numbers, uh, you uh, there are two kinds of Sterling numbers. Sterling Sterling number one, you see these are uh, these these are the functions in Mathematica, and uh, uh, Sterling number uh, oh this is a sum checking that the expression in Mathematica is correct, uh, and. Uh, uh, so there is a Sterling the Sterling numbers of the first kind they're called. They uh, uh, describe the the number of permutations which have a given uh, number of cycles. So if you have a permutation of five, let's say with five cycles, uh, that must be uh, the identity. Yes, there's one. You have a permutation of uh, five with one cycle, then that must be all the cycles. In every cycle, you can start with one and put the others in an arbitrary order. So that would be n minus one factorial, yes? And you have some expressions in between. So these uh, Sterling S1 numbers uh, describe precisely our basis of trees, if you remember. Our basis of trees had uh, trees uh, had a partition of uh, of a permutation into uh, subsets, and then in every subset you you ended with the highest one, so it's equivalent to to a Sterling S one number. The Sterling S two, the Sterling uh, numbers of the second kind are very interesting. Uh, they give you the following. If you have, uh, in our case, if you have a, a, a set of coordinates, so in this case, the, the coordinates are the vertices of the simplex, yes? 
So you see how many coordinates do we have here? We have four coordinates, yes. Uh, we are in 3D space, but we have four coordinates because the sum of the coordinates is zero. Yes, so this is a root lattice here. Now, uh, when you have degenerate uh, blades, for instance, a degenerate blade uh, can be a horizontal one. Yes? Now, that one, if you have, for instance, a horizontal plane like this, means that you take the bottom three points, you group them into a single one. Yes, so you take the simplex like this, and you, uh, you group the, the bottom ones into one, the top into one, so then you have a simplex like this, which has only two coordinates. Here you take a blade, and uh, which is just a point in this case, and this blade gives you a blade here, yes? Which you recognize as a degenerate thing. So now the number of ways to degenerate the, uh, uh, to de degenerate K to group together, yes, lump together K variables, into L subsets, that's a Sterling number of the second kind. So Sterling certainly knew which numbers were important. So once you, so, so this should be one of the ones which, uh, 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 you know, which group four into two. So this would be part of the Sterling four two. How many do we have? We have four of them of this kind. Yes, where we have one and the other three. And we have three in which you have two and the other two. Yes, if you have two and the other two, let me make here a little picture. Here you have two of them and the other two. You see, and again, you group them exactly like before. Uh, now you're going to group two and two. Yes, and the point here is going to give you a rectangle here, which is just another kind of uh, higher intertwiner. Yes, so these are the degenerate intertwiners. And you have seven of them, of the Sterling S2 kind. Now, the number of uh, uh, points in a simplex is a binomial. These are exactly binomial numbers. Yes, so the, the number of uh, uh, elements on a line is n, if you have, uh, uh, is n plus one, if you have n, n uh, segments. If you have n segments in the plane, you have something like n plus one times n plus two over two, yes? Because for a triangle, you take a triangle and you uh, you take a triangle and you add the second one like that, yes, and you have made now n plus one times n plus two points and. Uh, uh, it's over two because you put together two. And uh, uh, so the, the, the number of elements in, in, a, in a, the number of points in a simplex of integer coordinate points are binomial, co bi binomial numbers. And now, um, when you put together the uh, Sterling S1, the Sterling S1 gives you the number of degrees of freedom for every point. And uh, it's known that the sum of the Sterling S1s is, uh, is a factorial. So um, if you take that factorial and you take this binomial, so this is here n plus two, factorial over two factorial times 
over n factorial times 2 factorial. And uh, the number of, uh, for instance, here of independent blades at a point is this. Yes, it's one like this and one like this. So here it's two factorial. So uh, now if you take the inner points, so you take the inner points, then you have in this case uh, n minus one factorial over n minus three factorial times two factorial. There are two factorial uh, blades of higher co-dimensions at every point. That's using the Stirling, uh, Stirling of the first kind. And so what you get is n minus 1 factorial over n minus 3 factorial. And uh, now when you take this um, so this is for the inside, and you have a similar formula for the inside of an edge and for a point. So when you sum these against the uh, Stirling 2s, so you ta sum this times Stirling 2 of n here uh, of... Uh, Two and uh, and one, and you have another. So you sum the you sum the Stirling two. You sum this o also over all those quotients. Uh, the amazing thing that you get is that the total number is exactly uh, n to the power the number of coordinates uh, minus one. total blades in all co-dimensions. And this is exactly the number of points on the high matrix diagonal. Remember that the diagonal, for instance, in 2D, the diagonal is this, of a higher matrix, which is, which is exactly here, n by n. Yes, so you have n square. And you can see here also that you have a few degenerates, but uh, except for these, do you see this is n minus 1 times n minus 2, yes? So these would, uh, these would give you inner points here, and then the others are exactly on the edge, and they correspond to the degenerate blades. So uh, the non-degenerate blades here, so again, the points which are on these diagonals, so the partly degenerate ones and degenerate ones correspond exactly to degenerate blades. So now, the, the importance of this is the fact that when you have uh, the usual representation theory, you have SLN, GLN. GLN has n elements on the diagonal. Yes, one of them is separated, which is the, uh, the determinant, the sum. Yes, if you look at the Lie algebra, the sum of the elements. That's because the determinant has its own representations. It's, it separates from the rest. Yes, so when you represent a matrix which has non-trivial determinant, you can represent this determinant and then the rest of the matrix, which is in SLN. But altogether, the Weil theory tells us that there are just as many um, degrees of freedom in the representation as there are, uh, as there are uh, elements on the diagonal. And if you want to characterize a representation, you take its highest weight. Its highest weight will be a diagonal, would be an eigenvalue for the, uh, would be a weight on the, uh, 
will give you some numbers on the diagonal. So, and these numbers are actually, uh, in the usual case, they are the number of, for instance, if we take GL, uh, GL4, yes, then we have the number of single dots, then we have some double dots, uh, some triple dots, and if we have uh, if we have also the determinant, then we may put an extra four one. Yes, so this is a determinant to the power to some power. Yes, so here it will be determinant square. So this is what is known as a young, uh, young diagram. Yes, uh, the higher young. Now this uh, this young diagram is in our notation. Uh, these are the. Uh, it's a line divided in two, and you put here the number three. This is for single dots, for double dots, for triple dots. And the degenerate one really, so this would be here three to two and maybe a two here for the determinant. Yes, uh, that's a notation for this, yes. And remember that in the Gelfand settling, this was a number of veggies that we were growing. Three veggies here, two veggies here, two. And the others we didn't even bother to to uh, uh, do it, although in the original Gerfan settling they do it. And um, this, something like this, so a way to grow vegetables out of these, uh, out of these bases, yes, this is exactly a vector in the Gerfan settling representation. Remember the lesson on the Gerfan settling. Uh, so, uh, now, according to this computation that we just did, I think that, uh, I mean, at least I saw that uh, uh, William and Chase were checking this in the, for the two-dimensional case uh, in pictures. Uh, that's very interesting to check, in fact, because what, what this shows is that uh, uh, these generalized intertwiners, as I said, I don't have uh, an intertwiner uh, interpretation for the dot, although this might come at some point. Um, but these generalized intertwiners, uh, they correspond exactly, they correspond this way exactly to the uh, uh, Young diagrams. So, if you want a young diagram in the plane, what you're going to do is you you can add generators. You see, these are generators. You'll have multiplicities, and uh, uh, you can add some points here. This one two two times and so. And what we're going to ask here is that the uh, uh, the multiplicity of every edge. So we add them edge by edge. Yes, we add them separately. When we work in codimension one, we neglect the higher codimensions. Yes. So as here we take only, we look at the multiplicity of every segment, yes? So, uh, and uh, um, we must make sure that, so here for instance, we could subtract these two, do you see, like this. Uh, so we could have a, a picture like this, for instance, which is not a sum of generators with positive things, so this one, is this plus this other one subtracting the line. Can you see? It's one letter Y plus a reverse letter Y subtract then the line, yes? Then you get this one. 
So uh, the condition is that the, uh, from the theory of intertwiners, that uh, the multiplicity of every segment should be non-negative, of every shard should be non-negative. Yes, so these would be the, then the higher intertwiners. And at the same time, they are the things from which you build representations. We'll discuss this a little bit more next uh, week. But uh, these are intertwiners in one theory, in the two-dimensional, I mean, in the, for the usual one-dimensional theory, here, one-dimensional theory, the Young diagram, which gives you the representation, is one-dimensional. You see, it's a segment cut into pieces, yes? The intertwiners between representations are counted by these blades. So the theorem is that the number of intertwiners is exactly the number of ways to write these blades, yes? Except that, as I said, I don't have an interpretation for the dots, single dots, yes? Mm. I mean, there are some, um, but in any case, so um, if you want the Gelfand settling here, yes, the Gelfand settling representation is simply an intertwiner in which you neglect the horizontals. Yes, so here you, you allow, for this vector, you allow, for instance, a wire to go this way. But in, uh, if you had not neglected it, then you'd have a letter Y here, yes? Actually, you can collect these letter Ys, and amazingly, they give you exactly the weight of a vector. So the weight of a vector is obtained by taking this vector, then adding all the uh, adding with signs plus or minus all the horizontals in order to make it an intertwiner, except for positivity. So if you have, a, for instance, this, you add this with plus. If you have a, uh, a bend this way, uh, excuse me, the other way, you add one with minus one, yes. This is, again, this is exactly, uh, this is a, uh, a letter Y from which we subtracted the horizontal, yes? You see these wires have a nice conservation. Uh, actually, you can think of it, uh, I think Thruthi was doing uh, mechanics or so, yes? You, uh, if, you, if you move in a car, and well, not in, in a car, but in space, yes? If you want to change your direction, you see like this, then you need to throw a pebble this way, yes? Right? You cannot change direction. It's the same for curvature, but uh, yes. And here, you need to be hit by, I mean, you, you have just the opposite, uh, the opposite thing, yes? You need to be pulled by something, right? in order to change direction. So the uh, very interesting fact, which I found relatively late in the experience, was that if you sum these here on the edge, yes, you'll get some numbers. And those numbers are exactly the weight of the respective vector. Yes, so the weight is also defined in a very geometric way, this way. If you look at Gelfan, so Gelfan and Selden, of course, don't have the vegetables. These vegetables are defects with respect to the inequality. So they have some inequalities. If you write the difference between the two members of the inequality, you get the wires. Now, the wires here have a conservation relation. And the conservation relation, so let me, that's the next topic, conservation relations. I'm going to turn on the uh, uh, this and uh, lift it for the moment.
Now, for the conservation relations, Okay, uh, local, uh, okay, so let, let me write first, uh, well, let me write, so uh, local or conservation relations. So in the case of a play, so first of all, when you have a, a co-dimension two shard, then uh, it's an intersection of uh, hyperplanes. And remember that our hyperplanes were xA is equal to uh, n in z. Yes, where well, this is a subset. So where things like x1 plus uh, x134 which is x1 plus x3 plus x4. Yes, this is equal to an integer. Now, when you have to, uh, an intersection of, let's say, two hyperplanes, and uh, in that case, you can make the two hyperplanes, so this is xA and then x, uh, uh, a complement is equal to uh, S minus uh, N. So because X A union with A complement is S, so is a constant. Remember that we work the sum of coordinates is constant. So now if you have here the set A, A complement, And here you have uh, B and B complement. These are the two hyperplanes. Then uh, there are two situations here, which in the non-trivial case, namely when uh, all four, all four uh, subsets are, are non-empty. Uh, so for instance, one, two, three, four, so A is 1, 3, and B is 1, 2 as a set. So we call such an intersection uh, non-degenerate. And uh, so this is really a Venn diagram, if you want, uh, like in, the, in your early school days. And you have four regions and this is A, and this is uh, B, and uh, the situations are when all subsets are non-empty, or when one of them is empty. If two of them are empty, then A and B are the same, more or less. So uh, the other is a degenerate when one is empty. And the typical case is this one here, where you have uh, x1, so this is, uh, uh, for instance, you have uh, 1, 2, and 3, uh, and this one is empty. Here, the number of coordinates is 3, and uh, this is exactly the intersection in the plane. So in that case, there is, a, uh, there, is, there is a third hyperplane. And now when you look at plates, then you can take this plate plus this plate minus the horizontal plate, and this gives you this plate. So it means that you can generate around the degenerate plane, you can generate everything. So no condition. This is a degenerate. Around the degenerate 
plate, there's no condition for uh, degenerate intersection, there's no condition for plates. You can generate everything. However, when you look at a non-degenerate, the plate uh, uh, is always, you can check in the expansion of our generator that it's always half, either half or empty or everything. So now, if you have this, then there's a, uh, if you take the alternating, the sum with these signs, you see plus, minus, plus, minus, yes? So you take the multiplicity here, minus the multiplicity here, plus here, minus here, yes? This sum is zero. So this was uh, a condition which has appeared in the talk of Timothy Gowers for instance, in, uh, in, condition, in connection with some number theories. In any case, you have this whenever you intersect half uh, planes. Uh, whenever you take, uh, not intersect, whenever you take sums with multiplicity of half planes. Is this part clear? So if you take around a point, if you take a half plane and another half plane, yes? For each half plane, it satisfies this condition, yes? So this one, uh, uh, a search, a bibliographical search, showed that it was uh, uh, known in the 1950s, 60s, when they did, uh, they did something which is uh, uh, in quantum field theory. And... Uh, it's a Steinemann relation. They didn't use it for plates in particular, but uh, so the local, now the condition, uh, the, the main theorem is that uh, uh, if the multiplicities for uh, on shards of co-dimension zero satisfy the Steinemann relations at the uh, non-degenerate points, uh, this is necessary and sufficient for them to be a sum of plates. This is not an easy theorem. Once again, the statement is that you check, uh, for instance, uh, the expression with trees that we have, those trees were satisfying the local, the Steinemann relations, just as a little example. So, once again, if you have some multiplicities, you check the Steinemann relation and you, you, uh, you find whether uh, it is or not a linear combination of plates. And what you do is, you, for the proof, you go backwards. If you have the Steinemann relations, then you keep subtracting plates until you clean up uh, uh, a kind of hyperplane. So, uh, and then you continue. Now, uh, what's the equivalent condition for the, um, and in the last minute or so, that thing's a bit fast, I'm going to give you the conservation relation, conservation relation for uh, blades. This is in arbitrary codimension. Uh, these so the conservation relation for blades. Now look, if you have, for instance, this blade, you see there's one which enters, one which exits, yes? And this was exactly why we could call the, uh, uh, the Gelfand Zetlin uh, things vegetables, yes? Because they satisfy this conservation relation, yes? The conservation relation here is that for any special hyperplane, which means uh, hyperplane of this form, yes, the number of whenever you have uh, an affine, these are these are here affine roots. The number of uh, the ones on one side of the hyperplane is equal to the number on the other side. And in the last few seconds, I'm going to prove this for you. So you have a set here. So uh, proof 
And this holds then for everything. So the proof is the following. You take, uh, uh, so um, choose the affine, so relabel, so that you have the affine, the affine roots. Remember that the blade, higher co-dimension blades were starting with the fine roots, yes, and it was a span of all the fine roots. Now the fine roots should be one, two, two, three, up to n uh, minus one n, and uh, uh, n, uh, so this is plus one, negative one, uh, zero, zero, and so on, up to n and one. Yes. So these are the these are fine roots, H one two, H two three, H three four, and the the fine one H N one. Yes. And now this is a subset A. So we have X A is equal to some K. Yes, and this is a subset A. And now notice that. Uh, if you have here a plus one, negative one, yes, so if you take the inner product, so the A has, uh, is here zero, zero, one, 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 zero, one, one, zero, zero. And when you take the inner product with a one, negative one, you see then you get here a negative one. Yes, which means that that the respective root is underneath. If you have a descending part, you take here the inner product with a one negative one, you'll get here plus one. So for every segment of the set A, you will get one affine root which is over and one affine root which is uh, which is under and one affine root which is over. Yes. So, uh, since uh, there are equally many ascents as descents in this, uh, you, have, you get the conservation relation. Yes, so this shows that, uh, and uh, the big uh, theorem is that this conservation relation is, uh, is necessary and sufficient uh, for uh, co-dimension one blades. And uh, uh, I haven't checked it, but it's, uh, it's, uh, I think it's likely to be true also in a higher co-dimension. So uh, this is a local condition which is, which, is, uh, uh, which is necessary and sufficient. Uh, once again, what this tells you is that if you have here a hyperplane, you look, for instance, at... Uh, uh, you look at any linear combination of blades, the number of uh, the multiplicity of the things above, strictly above it, is the same as the uh, multiplicity of the things below it. Yes, so no matter what uh, hyperplane you take. So for instance, here you have four such segments and four underneath, and you can have in any with any and so on, as long as the conservations are satisfied. So this shows that you can speak about uh, uh, things growing and, and so on. Yes, so I have to stop here. And we'll continue, we'll have next week, uh, it will be an overview of the representation and I will give the explicitly the representation for a generator. Uh, so the way the matrices act on these on these vegetables. So once again, the uh, statement here, before you go, yes, uh, you can look at it in the following way. You can see actually here a very nice blade in the middle, you see. So here is a tetrahedron, do you see? Here is a simplex, yes? Uh, here in black, there's a diagonal of the higher matrix. Yes, with all the integer points. So the diagonal is here six times bigger as volume. 
Yes, because the diagonal is a, uh, is a parallelepiped, while the simplex is a simplex, which is 1 over n factorial of the parallelepiped. Now, uh, however, if you take all these strange co-dimension vegetables, like this one, for instance, and all the others, up to linear, so all the linearly independent ones, which come degenerate or not, you'll get exactly as many as there are points in the higher diagonal. That's a statement. So here, they're very concentrated. You have uh, points, you have... Uh, segments, you have uh, things of various co-dimensions and so, and, uh, but there are as many as in this, yes, in this simplex, as there are points overall, yes? Now, since the ratio is here n factorial, 6, yes, which is 3 factorial, yeah? This means that generically you have three, three uh, things, uh, uh, at this point, uh, I mean at each point, yes, and, and you, can, uh, you can check that that's, that's the case. So, uh, so, uh, mm, so you will have six, and these six are the following. There are two co-dimension one blades in 3D. Two co-dimension one blades, so the co-dimension, they're, they're the ones we start with one, two. So they're one, two, three, four, and one, two, four, three. Then there are three sticks, three linearly independent sticks. They are the letter Y's in three of the four directions, and one dot. So altogether they make one plus three plus two, which is six, six degrees of freedom at every point, yes? And these, you can view them as intertwiners. They will appear, as you will see, in the uh, klebsch gordon coefficients, which we'll mention next week, and in 6J symbols uh, for the usual, the usual mathematics. But uh, if you look at them higher up, they would be the higher young, uh, young uh, diagrams, yes? So, and uh, there is a very interesting uh, Fourier transform, which is uh, uh, this one, in which uh, uh, you map them. So I'll describe this uh, at some other point, or it will be uh, in the book. The idea is, so this is a head of this one. Do you see the upper simplex of this one? You have here a, uh, a permitohedron, as you can see. And the thing at the top is, the, uh, is exactly our ribbon. Remember, we had a ribbon, yes? The ribbon was made of weights. You can see that this, the top has a different crystallography from the bottom, yes? Bottom is roots. These are weights, yes? And these are this uh, yellow-orange thing is exactly the vial, uh, the fundamental chamber of vial. Yes, and you have here, uh, each of them is classified then by, by the center of the permitohedron, or the generalized permitohedron. So the generalized permitohedron is a center. Uh, it passes through the origin, and so the radius is given this way, and uh, uh, what's encoded here are the degenerations. Namely, when you have a, a letter Y, for instance, it degenerates to lines to three lines, yes, away from the intersection. So the lines here correspond to degeneration. So it's a very, it's a very powerful uh, transform. Uh, and it's, uh, it's uh, uh, very non-obvious. So uh, let's stop, uh, let's stop here. So you can see there's a, a bit more material than, uh, than classes. This was a, uh, one year course uh, condensed into one semester, but uh, if you take a course in representation theory, then you take only representations. And moreover, they were done only, they were done a hundred years ago, so that uh, kind of streamlines, it's, it makes it easier to give references at least. And so, but this is a situation for, for what I have. But it's encouraging to know that uh, 
you know that there is this higher mathematics which uh, which has a non-zero chance. That's the that's why you hear it has a non-zero chance to be what's needed to build the actual non-perturbative quantum field theory. Yes, uh, just because the usual uh, math, you know, builds beautifully the 2D non-perturbative theory, which is the one used in string theory. Yes, on the string. So it's a conformal field theory. So the idea is to do exactly what you do in conformal field theory, but with this one. Yes, in two dimensions higher. So that's uh, so the idea is simple that way. Yes, just use this math to go two dimensions higher and uh, very good. So William, yes. Uh, Okay, can you help me with, oh.